together, if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. And while you're turning to the 24th chapter of Matthew, you know, several hundred years ago, Christians got together and they decided that simply observing Christmas uh, one day a year uh, was not enough for them. And so I appreciate what Beth said, you know, about Christmas music, we love it, we uh, enjoy it, we uh, oftentimes get started, you know, earlier than actually Christmas Day in most traditions. And, uh, and as we do, you know, we are saying that uh, we want to focus on Christ. And several hundred years ago, that's what people got together and they decided that, you know, it wasn't enough just to talk one Sunday or one day a year about the birth of Christ because it's such an amazing thing that the eternal God, in His complete, uncontainable majesty, contained Himself in the form of a human body. Fully God and fully man when Jesus entered this earth. Now, this is such an amazing miracle. We get the basic parts of it, but it is so incredible that we ought to spend some more time on. Um, and certainly focusing even more time on the cross and the resurrection, but focusing on Jesus. And that impresses me because what that's saying is that even several hundred years ago, before all the technology, before all the hustle and bustle and all the rush and race and rat race that we talk about in our society, people already realized that, you know what, we need to set some time aside to focus on Christ this season. We plan our Christmas lists, uh, shop, cook, hang out, all those things that we're going to do uh, in the Christmas season. Uh, but where is Jesus in our preparations? And what are we going to do? So to start the season off, and we want to talk about watching and what it means to be watching, uh, as the Bible uses that term, watching even for Jesus' next appearance. He appeared once, but Christians even several hundred years ago recognized that, hey, you know what? Jesus is going to appear again. The second coming is going to happen. And so uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, this morning. You know, we want to guard against the same mistakes that were made at Christ's first coming. Those who read more into the scripture than was intended to be there and therefore didn't recognize Jesus when he was standing right in front of them. And also those who uh, simply missed what the Old Testament was saying. And, and again, uh, or at least had a difficult time recognizing Jesus for who he was. Watching is not a passive thing that we do. Now we use the word watch usually to mean something passive. You know, you watch the clock. The clock's doing all the work. We're watching it. You watch a ball game. They're doing all the work. We're just standing there cheering maybe or groaning, depending on uh, whether you're for Michigan or for Ohio State. And aren't you grateful they went for that two-point conversion at the end of the game? Uh, it depends uh, which side you're up as far as which. But watching is passive. You know, we uh, watch things, but watching biblically is not a passive thing. When the Bible uses the word watch, it's not talking about sitting by and doing nothing. It's something very active. And we're going to uh, dive into that. If you found uh, Matthew 24, and if you're able to, uh, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 14. So we've got several verses here to look at. It says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here uh, will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will all this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am Christ. And will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. 
Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Lord, thank you again for this time and for your word, for your power. I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross, that only your words are heard, and that your word would accomplish its purpose today. We do all this for you and because of you, Lord Jesus. And in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. You know. Uh, to be prepared, to be watching, means to be faithful. When we hear uh, the Bible say to us that we're to watch or to keep watch, it, it always describes being faithful. And here I'm saying that yeah, today it means to be faithful to God's Word. Because Jesus said in verse 4, Watch out that no one deceives you. Deceit comes from the world, but truth comes from the Word of God. So be faithful to what is true. And where is truth? It is found in God's Word. So uh, if you follow my logic here, be faithful to God's Word. To be watching, to be prepared. To uh, be prepared for this season, to be prepared for the times that we live in, to be even prepared or ready for Jesus coming again. Be faithful, and specifically in this passage, be faithful to God's Word. What is Jesus saying here? Uh, watch is a word that he uses more than once. Uh, well, who is who watching and what is being watched? You know, sometimes, again, we use that word or think of that word as being passive, but it's an active thing. It's, it's faithfulness to God. Well, Jesus is responding to questions asked by his disciples. You know, uh, they are uh, walking out of Jerusalem, Jesus, for the last time as uh, one who would walk uh, among their midst. He is going to be betrayed. He is going to be uh, handed over to the authorities. He's going to be crucified. On the third day, he's going to rise again. But he's, he's leaving that place. And as they do, the disciples, bless their hearts, they miss it. You know, Jim Mays used to say, bless your heart means uh, you're ridiculous. Bless your heart. They missed what was going on. The living tabernacle of God was walking away. And they're looking at the buildings going, aren't they so pretty? Aren't they so nice? And Jesus says, listen, I'm telling you that there's coming a time when not one stone would be on top of another. Privately, later as they go out to the Mount of Olives, they ask him, when will that happen? When is the temple going to be destroyed is the question that they're asking. And what is a sign of the end of the world? There's kind of two questions here at least. And Jesus goes on, and starting in verse 4, and he talks about how um, that uh, there are going to be some signs that are going to precede these events. Now, for us, we understand that there's actually two events that are going to be taking place here. Jesus is talking about two events. One is the destruction of the temple as they knew it, and it would happen 40 years after Jesus was speaking. And then he's also talking about the end times. And as God so often does, there's a pattern to his work. And so there's going to be a pattern. He says, listen, there's going to be nine signs that will precede both events. And he talks about them. There's going to be false messiahs. There's going to be wars. There's going to be nation against nation. There's going to be kingdom against kingdom. Famines and earthquakes and a major evangelistic thrust. All these things are going to take place. Well, looking at them individually, those things have, in various, uh, to various degrees, have always existed. They existed in the Old Testament. There are wars, there are famines, there are nations against nations. There was a great persecution. Just read the book of Esther when a secular uh, king was almost tricked into wiping out the entire uh, Jewish race. And certainly since then, all of these things have existed to one degree or another. But Jesus is saying here that they will in, be intensified like never before. They were, in regards to the temple, severe, and they will be, again, severe. Now, Jesus, just taking the question 
of the temple because that's what he's talking to them about. He'll want to say in the uh, 24th chapter that um, uh, God's uh, people will witness the temple destroyed. It will happen in their generation. All right. So uh, one of the things that he's talking about, he's addressing their first question. And he's saying, listen, there's going to be the, the cycle of things that are going to happen. Now, the book of Acts describes some of the false Christs that arose during the time of the early church. In Acts chapter 5, we are introduced very briefly to uh, two individuals. Uh, Thutis and Judas the Galilean, and they uh, had messianic uh, visions, and they thought that they were the, the one who tried to uh, claim that they were the Christ, and, and so that was a partial fulfillment of what Jesus is talking about here. Some people also uh, lined up Simon Magus from Acts chapter 8. It's interesting, though, as I researched this, that there were scholars, not biblical writers, but other historians from the time, <laughs> Uh, Josephus and Tacitus, who, while they didn't set out to uh, demonstrate what Christ said here, they, in effect, actually uh, documented all of these signs that Jesus talks about. Before the destruction of Jerusalem, they documented how these things happened, uh, specifically violence and war, and how it increased in their lifetime, and in their setting, unlike anything they'd seen or had been known before, how famine and earthquakes were more prevalent, how persecution happened, and of course the Bible tells us how the gospel was taken around the known world through the missionary journeys of Paul and other Christians who were uh, stretching out the gospel. And so, in, in a sense, right before the destruction of the temple, all of these things began to increase. And in the year A.D. 70, indeed, the Romans came, and they sieged the city. It was a lengthy siege and people starved and per people turned on each other and betrayed each other. And there was great persecution, especially to anyone who claimed the name of Christ. And then the uh, Romans won the battle and they came in and destroyed the temple. And not one single stone has been on top of another for 1,943 years and counting. Carried all that out exactly as Jesus said. Big surprise there for God's people, right? Hmm. This was God's judgment for the unbelief and rejection uh, of Jesus and the plan of salvation by Jerusalem. There, these were times of distress, though, that Jesus knew that the believers who lived in that day and time would have to face uh, before the end of the world. And he's saying, listen, uh, God's people, that's who, need to be watching. God's people need to be ready. God's people need to be faithful and know what's going on so that you are not deceived. And that was an example. However, he's also in this passage talking about the coming of the end of the age, uh, to use the disciples' words there in verse 3. Um, a time of distress in A.D. 70, but not the end of the world. However, these signs will intensify again. And I take verses uh, 4 through uh, verse 14 to go with Revelation chapter 6, which talks about the first half of the tribulation, and verse, 20, uh, verse 15 through 28 to go with uh, the, verse, uh, the chapters in Revelation that talk about the second half of the tribulation. Uh, and you can see, uh, if you're uh, studying uh, Revelation or have studied Revelation, how that, that uh, matches up and what Jesus is talking about and what Jesus will show John later in Revelation. But in verse 21, he says, you know what? In those days, it will be an unequaled distress. It, it'll be unlike anything else that has ever gone before it. And so Jesus is talking uh, about here and, and in uh, the chapter about being faithful and specifically faithful to God's word. Because he says three times in the chapter, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. How do we avoid being deceived? We need to be faithful to God's word. Because God has what we need in it. Now, we admit we don't have everything about the conclusion of the world figured out, do we? There are pieces that seem to be missing, things we're, uh, as individual students of the Bible, maybe still learning, but I think there's also some things that God has not yet shown to us or will not show to us because, you know what, it's not about setting a date or a time or knowing exactly when because, you know what, we're human beings, and if we knew when, what would we likely do? 
We put off doing what we need to do until it was closer to the time. And God says, no, you know what? You need to be ready all of the time. No way. You need to be always ready. And so Jesus is talking about here not being deceived, being faithful to God's word. And, and so we don't want to be deceived by religious sounding things. You know, when somebody shows up and says, I'm the Christ, don't be deceived by that. There are many who claim to have the words of God, the words of Christ, that don't. And how are we going to know the difference? The Bible says you know them by their fruit, but also to know them because you know the word of God well enough that you'll recognize the false. Years ago, a pastor, uh, my pastor in, in uh, Arizona told me that um, this is how people who uh, work in the Treasury Department learn their craft. You know, the Treasury <coughs> Department is uh, tasked with um, rounding up counterfeiters. How, how do you recognize a counterfeit bill? Well, they don't spend a lot of time teaching them all the different kinds of counterfeit bills. They hand them the real thing and they say, get to know this. You know, in our currency, there are certain uh, security features, the little strip that's embedded in it, uh, things you can hold up to the light and see, and all the artwork and so forth, and how it's supposed to be and how it's organized. Get to know the real thing and you'll recognize a counterfeit every time. So if we get to know the real thing, we'll recognize the false. Every time. So Jesus said, don't be deceived. Be faithful to God's word. Not everything that sounds religious is from God. Go to the source. Go to Jesus and God's word. So that's one of the things that he's telling them uh, here because he's saying, listen, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to say a lot of convincing things. They're going to come and they're going to say, um, I am the Christ and deceive many. Uh, plus all the things that people are going to witness. Plus all of the persecution that they may be faced with and have to endure. How are you going to stand against that if you're not grounded in God's words? So don't be deceived. Another thing that he's saying here is not to be uh, so attracted to the world or the things that we build here. Again, they were so amazed with the buildings. You know, in the modern generation, in church life, it was customary to evaluate uh, the growth of a church based on three things. I call them the ABCs. Do you know the ABCs? Attendance, buildings, and cash. The ABCs. That's how we evaluate, was the church growing or not? Was, you know, was there more people there? Or were there in a new building project? And was there more cash on hand? In fact, some churches even amassed huge savings accounts and these kinds of things, you know. Today, uh, for all the things that we don't like that's going on around us, at least one thing that maybe we have learned is that we evaluate the health of a church based on the transformation that's taking place. Are people growing in the Lord and are people trusting the Lord for their Savior? You know, those things first and foremost and a faithfulness that goes along with that. Um, but it's interesting that they were so uh, enamored by the buildings. Verse 1, they even uh, came up to Jesus to call his attention to the buildings. And we are told that they were pretty amazing architectural designs for their day. And, and they were pretty impressive. But, you know, Jesus says, listen, you got your focus, your attention on the wrong things. But, you know, buildings are tools to use. And it's fine when they're comfortable and look nice and they're functional and useful and all that kind of stuff. But that's not the end and that's not the importance of it. Because all the buildings, every building that's ever been built is either going to be destroyed or it's going to gradually wear out. It may take a lot of time, but eventually one of those two things is going to happen to it. In fact, everything on this earth eventually is going to burn up, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be left behind. It doesn't have value. Focus on what does last. Jesus says in this chapter and in other places in the scripture that his words endure forever. So be faithful to his word. Hold on to trust his word because his words will never pass away. 
He's saying to them also, don't be shaken and shrink back. Don't be, don't be shaken. Don't be mixed up. Don't be uh, alarmed. Don't be concerned. And, and in fact, don't even be surprised when uh, things happen and the world is in tumult. Don't be surprised when uh, a lost world rejects what you have to say. We have the greatest good news and, the, and joy and the uh, satisfaction and the confidence of knowing the King of Kings and the creator of this world. And we just get so uh, befuddled sometimes why people aren't just beating a path to our door to hear about how they can know that Savior too. You know what? Jesus said that uh, the light came into the world, but men preferred the darkness. You know, people prefer that. And so we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be shaken and, uh, and shrink back. We shouldn't be alarmed. And we shouldn't even be alarmed when unbelief is judged like it was in AD 70. Their time of distress was then. But even then, God was saying to them, focus on a kingdom that never ends. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, Hebrews continues, I'm reading chapter 10, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who believe and are saved. Not to be surprised by the things that we see going around. It's not to be shaken. Not to be upset. Not to be so you know uh, worked up about it that, that we're um, put on the sidelines for God's kingdom. But rather to understand that yes, we just maintain our faith and we just stand faithfully on the word of God. Because God's going to carry out his plan and he is faithful and he will do it. So we are we're faithful. You know, at the end of the 24th chapter, Jesus gives a short parable of sorts. And, and um, beginning in verse uh, 44, actually, he says, You also must be ready, not only in 70 A.D., but also speaking to all Christians who would ever believe. Uh, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? Whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. Verse 45. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. It will be good. Be faithful like the servant in this parable. And we'll come back to this parable again. But it says that a, a faithful and wise servant is one who gives that his fellow servants food at the proper time. Now, when Jesus is using parables, he's using a story to teach something about eternal truths, and he mentions food, what do you suppose that food represents? It represents God's Word. That we feed on the Word of God, that we're faithful to the Bible and what the Bible says. Well, again, Jesus was talking to people who were going to experience a great calamity back in 70 AD, 1,943 years ago. Well, what does the Bible mean when you and I are also told to watch? It's still the same, to be faithful to God's Word. To be faithful to God's Word in times of distractions as well as distress. Times of distractions. I'm using that word to mean times when, when things get all uh, turned upside down, when, when there's things that deceive. You know, the false teaching or, or the things that are just prevalent around us that, that attempt to mislead us. We live in distracting times. We have a secular world around us that is preaching a message that is based on something that is false and wrong and ultimately based on evil that is meant to harm us. Don't we? Yes. All right. Thank you. I'm glad somebody's with me. Maybe get the rest of you along here in a uh, uh, short time. Distractions. The world has a version of how the world's going to end. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. TV, movies, video games, stories, all this kind of thing. Yeah, 
to be out there. And, and you know, how the world's going to end. You know, the world is not going to end when an asteroid hits us. Just got some news flash for you in case you weren't sure about that. It ain't going to happen. You watch these history channel programs. I don't, but I've seen them advertised. You know, what the world's going to be like after people are gone and there's just animals and plants left. It ain't going to happen. The world ain't going to end that way. The world's versions are all false. Jesus gives the truth, so we love to see what he has to say. However, we're also mindful that sometimes Christians have gotten off on some tangents too, and we need to be very careful that we're not deceived. Notice in verse 4, he says, uh, or verse 5 rather, um, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ. You know, they're, they're going to be kind of misleading us. Maybe some intend to, maybe some are just repeating something that they've heard and they just didn't take time to check it out for themselves. Hmm. In the uh, first millennium, A.D. 1000, uh, Christians were so convinced that Jesus was coming again immediately in the uh, end of the year, at the beginning of the millennium, when it turned 1000. To use a phrase from a few years ago, it was Y1K, all right? And they were so convinced that Jesus would come again that they didn't plant any crops that year, which means they had a limited food supply, not enough to last, and they didn't have any seed for the follow-up year. Famine and disease and all kinds of bad things came as a result. In the uh, early 1800s in the United States, there were those who were so convinced that Jesus was going to come again, and they began to set dates, and they had exact particular times that people sold their property, sold their businesses, gave all their possessions away, went out and stood on the hill and waited. <laughs> it didn't happen. More recently, some of you may remember the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Again in 1988. Oops. Or Harold Camping and his predictions from more recent days. You know, if we're faithful to God's word, we're going to be so much less likely to be misled and caught up, to be deceived by the distractions of this world. Now, don't get me wrong. There is an end coming. Okay? The Bible is very clear. There is an end coming. The trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and we who remain will join them in the air to meet and to welcome our Christ face to face. Amen. The trumpet is going to sound. As the Christian comedian Mike Warkey used to say about Gabriel, he's going to toot, we're going to scoot. <laughs> now I'm looking forward to that day. And I think all people who belong to Christ have that desire. We can't wait to see him face to face. As we look around a troubled world, we say, you know what? <laughs> if it's a day closer, I'm just that much happier about it. At the midnight cry, we're going to fly. The end is coming. But don't let others deceive you to the point that you would let up in your service to God, in your worship for God, in your growing in Christ, in your praying for the lost to be saved. Don't, don't let those visions so enrapture you that you forget that God has planted you where you are for a purpose. Look very carefully into the Word and stay faithful to the Word in times of distractions and also in times of distress. Because the end may be coming and it may be very close or, hard to believe sometimes, but God's plan may even be bigger than what our minds have conceived. Understand this, when it comes to knowing the times, Jesus says in verse 36, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And again in verse 42, he says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And again in verse 44, You must uh, also be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect Him. You know what? We live in times of distress and we think, oh, it's just got to be. Maybe God's plan is bigger. Or maybe it's all going to accelerate very quickly. We see signs, but they're not quite the unequal uh, degree that verse 21 talks about. And that could change. I, I have just come to this belief based on verse 44 and verse 46. That verse 44, we ought to live as though Jesus is coming again any minute. And yet work as though he isn't going to come in our lifetime. Because good 
pleasing to the master will it be for the one he finds working. My master is staying away a long time. It's the wrong way to think about it. He may be coming any time, but we need to be working, doing the wise and the faithful servant. It'll be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Yes, we live in times of distress, and, and we can list what those distresses are. We live in a time when there are wars, when there are uprisings that seem to be out of control all around the world, when uh, our news tells us of all and every natural disaster that exists around us. It deserves to be a constant reminder. There are times also that we sense that God's hand of judgment may be upon uh, a group for their unbelief and for their stubbornness and their rejection of Jesus and His plan of salvation. But our goal is not to um, uh, get so caught up in those things that we miss what God's doing. Our goal is to be faithful to God's Word and live it out and serve it and worship Him and grow in Him and reach others for Jesus and to tell them that there is a Savior who will rescue them from the coming wrath. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Jesus said, work for night is coming when no man can work. And he's given us a task to do. If we sense that it's getting close, then we ought to be busier than we've ever been for the kingdom. Why is it important that we as Christians today watch, that is, stay faithful to the Lord and to his word? Why is it important right now for all of us, regardless of our age, our situation in life, whatever it is, whether we're in work, school, retired, wherever our uh, life is right now, why is this important to us? Well, it's important that we hear these words because we are in times of distress. In this country, in our culture, there is an anti-Christian backlash against us, undeniable. I hesitate to use the word persecution because we really haven't endured what Christians in other countries have yet. Maybe coming. And we need to be ready. We need to be faithful to God's word, for if it does, we need to be ready. Also, it's important to us because we don't want to miss what God is doing. That was the tragedy of those in the first century who had only the Old Testament, and they either wrote more into it with their human traditions than was ever intended to be, and missed the Savior who was walking in their midst. What a tragedy. Or those who didn't understand it at all anyway, didn't put much importance on it. And here Jesus came to their town and preached and went on and they missed an opportunity. We don't want to miss what God is doing, so be faithful to God's word. And also again in the parable at the end of the chapter, he not only says he will reward the faithful and wise servant, he says, I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. And in verse 48, he says, suppose that servant is wicked. And he says, well, you know, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards. Oh, that master will come at a time when he does not expect and at an hour when he is not aware. And he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth does not mean that a person will lose their salvation. But in verse, uh, or, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it describes a person whose life is evaluated and who uh, is saved but as one just escaping the flames. It's the picture of someone who is in a burning house and escapes that uh, flaming inferno only with the shirt on the back, as we would say. They're saved but they have no reward. There is a loss. Paul specifically says, verse 3, there's a loss. Save and endure a loss. That's the price of unfaithfulness when the master returns. And he will return individually for us, or he'll return for all of us. But he is returning, so we must always be ready. In other words, we are to put away sin and to walk in holiness. We are to live upright lives, and we are to crucify the flesh. And we'll talk about that more tonight uh, as we meet together again for worship and hearing from God's Word and, and how we can make it our goal to please God. But our conduct is important, and how we live and how we uh, fight the good fight for the King of Kings is important in our lives. 
And so these are three reasons why it is important for us to be watching. Because times of distress are on us. Because we don't want to miss what God is doing. And because there are rewards for those who are faithful. And punishment for those who are unfaithful. So personally be faithful to the word of God. Not deceived, but living for Jesus. Fighting the good fight. Running the race. Keeping the faith. Make it, as 1 Peter 2 says, make it your purpose, your intention to crave pure spiritual milk. That is the word of God. To dive into the word of God. To uh, know and grow and understand the word of God and make it your life. Feed on the word of God every day. And brothers and sisters, encourage each other in the word of God. As long as it is today, Hebrews says, encourage each one another so we'll not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness, but that we'll be strengthened in the glory and the goodness of who God is. That we are ready, that we are ready, being faithful to receive Him when He comes. That uh, we're not caught sleeping, as the Bible says, but that we'll be walking in love, doing those things that God has given us to do, as Matthew uh, 24 tells us. Encouraging all the more as you see the day approaching, Hebrews chapter 10. So get involved and be growing and serving and helping others walk with Jesus and leading people to Jesus. And even more now, if the time is getting close, if we're close to the end or even close to a time of judgment in our society, then make it a priority to be involved. Doing more now for the kingdom than ever before. Growing and serving Him. Personally, to be faithful to the Word in the church. Also, to be centered on the Word of God and Jesus Christ as Lord. To be unified in Him. Not focused on stuff that passes away. Not letting uh, personality differences get in the way. But to be serving Him, loving Him, and let Him be Lord of our lives. If that's true of you, if you are pursuing those things, then praise God and thank you for your faithfulness. And understand that Jesus is saying to you that it's a good thing. And he will give to you uh, the rewards that uh, uh, verse 47 talks about. He says, I tell you the truth, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. There's a great reward for your faithfulness. And there's a great need for it now. And praise God for that. But if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, or you're not walking with Him as you should, then today is an opportunity to change that and to walk with Him uh, in faith and to have the hope of heaven and eternal life. And we invite you to that, to understand that Jesus took care of on the cross everything that you needed to do. Everything that had to be done for your salvation and forgiveness was taken care of at the cross. And it's offered to you as a free gift that you simply reach out your hands and accept that free gift and come and live for Him, give Him your life. If you made that decision, but you've not made that public, understand that Jesus, everyone that He ministered to, He called that person to a public commitment of Him. Public because it, it makes it real for us and public because it is a witness to somebody else. So during this invitation time, well, would you come and make that known to us or receive that gift or make that whatever decision or commitment that is to follow him, to be obedient to him, to what he's put on your heart. This invitation time is for you. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we... Uh...